I guess to start off, uh, how many of you, just raise, raise your hands, have used CDH5 before? Um, okay, great. No, this, this is perfect. Um, that's not, not a requirement, not an assumption. Um, at the end of this course, you will be totally, totally trained in CDH5 for optimizing all kinds of different things. To start off, I'm going to give a broad overview. No. <laughs> All right, false alarm. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start off. Uh, let, let's go over the, the structure of, of the four hours briefly. So I'm going to start off with a lecture about you know what is optimization, what is convex optimization, give you some examples. And then we're going to uh, make sure everybody is set up, can run like a, at least a little test script. There's like a hello world thing that you can do. Then we're going to, Riley will we'll talk about sort of the, the rules of how to set something up in CVX5. Um, and we have some exercises around that. Uh, and then Philip is going to lead uh, just a very focused uh, exercise session, starting with some material about, about finance and, and other things, but lots and lots of exercises in that, in that section on many different topics. Uh, to start off, I'm going to give a definition of one particular definition of a mathematical optimization problem. Uh, the standard form here is that we minimize. Uh, I think it's easier to uh, We minimize some objective f naught uh, applied to this variable x, which is you know a vector of dimension n here. Uh, we have inequality constraints that f of x is less than equal to zero for these different different functions f i, and then we have equality constraints. Now, this is just one particular way to think about an optimization problem, but it's it's one we're going to stick with for the course. And there are many many variations of this. Like, for example, you might want to maximize instead of minimize. You might have multiple objectives that you're somehow balancing. Uh, there's other kinds of sets that your functions can lie in, but they all, they all in some sense can be mapped into this standard form. So broadly, what would you use optimization for? Well, one case would be to choose some action, uh, some good or some best action, which might be, for example, the trades uh, in a portfolio. Um, that's a very common application of this, this technology choosing an optimal uh, set of trades in, in finance. Control of something like an airplane, where right? you have different things, different knobs you can turn with, with any sort of vehicle that you're controlling. Like in an airplane, I guess you have the ailerons or something. Um, and so you want to choose the best usage of all these knobs, of all these device, all these aspects of the thing you can control in order to, you know, for in terms of whatever whatever your objective is, it could be getting to a particular point in a smooth way, something like that. You might have some sort of logistics application. You want to route those packages as efficiently as possible. Uh, and X is like the plan for how you're going to move them. Allocation of resources, like for example, uh, capacity on a fiber optic network. And you have different constraints that limit what you can do, um, limit how, what positions you can take in your portfolio, for example. And then you want to, you have some metric of cost that you've come up with uh, that you want to minimize, um, or you want to maximize profit, which is the same as minimizing negative profit, right? And you, for whatever your application, you, you come up with some mathematical expression of, of what about and, and generally this is going to be a sort of a combination of multiple factors so you might be looking at, uh, at expected profit but also the risk for your portfolio um, you might be looking at fuel use versus um, like the time it's going to take to get to where you want to go uh, but there's different ways of combining all these things uh, in, into a single objective 
Also, engineering design, this is a really interesting application where X represents a circuit, some kind of device. We're going to have a cool example of this later. And you have different constraints on X from the manufacturing process uh, and whatever performance requirements you have on this circuit. That's to have some sort of clock rate. Uh, and then your objective is going to weight various things you might care about, like the cost, you know, the power consumption, whatever. But this is, this is a really, really nice application. Finding good models. Uh, well, this is uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with machine learning in some form or another. Uh, this is sort of the machine learning use case, where X is not really a physical thing um, that you're doing or building. Uh, it's just these more abstract parameters in your model. And here you're not as likely to have any constraints. Um, you might have some, like that they, they might sum up to one or something, something just required by the, the model that you're using. But, but constraints are, are less common in this situation. Uh, and then you want to minimize like your training error or something like that with perhaps a, a regularization term. Inversion, this, is a, this comes up in imaging, uh, which, is, which is something I worked on for a while. And the idea is that I, I have some measurement. Um, like for example, uh, an MRI machine is actually measuring a Fourier transform of sort of the volume that, that, you, wanna, that you wanna see. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting case. And so from this Fourier transform, you wanna go back uh, to the original thing. Uh, but maybe there's noise uh, or various other issues with the measurements, like some measurements are missing, like lots of things could, could go wrong. And so, you know, rather than just applying the inverse Fourier transform, you want to have some more robust methodology. And so one way to do this is through optimization, setting it up as an optimization problem, encoding different prior knowledge you have about uh, the image or the, the volume that you're trying to reconstruct. Uh, and this is, this is pretty much universal now in imaging, uh, in all kinds of applications. Um, like for example, you may have heard of this, um, uh, the image that was taken of a black hole. You might have seen that. I mean, so that's like, you know, it's not, that's a reconstruction in a, in a similar manner to, to what I'm talking about here. Uh, pessimization or worst case analysis. Uh, this is related to the idea of like adversarial examples in, in deep learning. And the general idea is you have some variables that are out of your control uh, and that are either under the control of the, you know, subject to the environment uh, or you could say they're in the control of an adversary. Uh, and you want to find what's the worst thing that could happen in this situation. What's the worst thing the adversary could do? And that's a good way of, you know, testing the robustness of your choices, of your setup, um, right? Because maybe there's, you optimized, like for example, you optimized your trades, but then you want to get some more sense of like how badly things could go. Um, and this is also a way to look at a lot of different um, ways, uh, different problems that arise in like choosing action and so forth. It's an interesting mathematical perspective too. Optimization based models are where you have some agent and you model the agent as taking an action that, that optimizes some function. Like for example, in economics you have this idea of agents maximizing their expected utility, right? They're solving this optimization problem. And in biology, you have this idea that organisms are optimizing or maximizing the reproductive success. Uh, you could say there are certain models of cells that reactions are running to maximize the growth of the cell. Uh, and then in, you have applications of this in physics too, for example, electric currents minimizing total, or electric circuit minimizing total power uh, with the to the current being sort of chosen, quote unquote, to minimize total power. And often these are very crude models, um, but, but as uh, you perhaps know, crude models can be extremely effective. Um, and they can work very, very well in practice. So the key takeaway here is that optimization arises in pretty much any area that you could imagine. I mean, I could have gone on with more stuff, uh, more, more, more uh, situations. Now the bad news is that while you can set up anything as an optimization problem, you can't necessarily solve it. And there are different exceptions to that rule. Convex optimization is a particularly nice 
set of optimization problems that you can solve and can solve very robustly and quickly. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of this course. Um, and I will say deep learning is not convex. So we're not going to talk about deep learning uh, unless you guys want to. <laughs> we, can, we can answer some questions, but uh, unfortunately not. Maybe someone will figure out someday how to make it convex. Here's the standard form for a. Did you get a laser pointer? Yeah, we did. we did. Thanks so much. Yeah. Here's the standard form for a convex optimization problem. So, harking back to the general form that I showed you before, we have this variable x, we the, the subjective f naught of x, and we have inequality constraints, and then we have equality constraints. But here, notice the equality constraints are linear. So, that's a requirement for convexity. You can't have nonlinear equality constraints. Another requirement is all these different functions have to be convex. Um, this is a formal definition, but basically it means they're kind of like bowl-shaped, like upward sloping curvature. Uh, that, that's, that's sort of a simple way to think about it. Um, there, there's a lot, a lot you could say about this, but this is, you don't need to worry about this too much. Just know that there's like, you know, a certain set of functions that, that are allowed. Now, the reason that this is such a nice subset of optimization problem, I think, is, is threefold. Like, one reason is, is the theory. There's really nice theory about these problems. And from that theory, you get things like uh, duality, which is this really nice way of measuring the effective constraints on the problem. Uh, there are many, many applications of duality in economics where prices uh, are derived from dual variables in these problems. Uh, and that's something you, you don't have in a lot of other optimization settings. Uh, you can verify the optimality of your solution, uh, which is by no means easy. Like in many, many settings, like you, you get some solution from your quote unquote optimizer. Like you don't know if that's, that's really the best solution possible or not. Uh, but here we, we can verify it. And this is very useful in the algorithms that have been developed for solving these problems, right? Because it's you know, obviously a very helpful stopping condition. Uh, and it lets us certify that we have the globally optimal solution. Uh, yeah, there are many, many algorithms that have been developed for different opti convex optimization problems, uh, and they have nice theoretical properties, but they're, I think more importantly, they work very well in practice. Like, there's a lot of engineering effort that has gone into this. Uh, and you can have, like, trading engines that are running, you know, every day or every hour, and people have, all, have confidence that this is going to work uh, every single time. It's a unification of a lot of things uh, like linear programming that, uh, and, and other uh, topics in optimization. And many, many applications. For example, machine learning and statistics. Uh, this is more like classical machine learning, what my advisor now calls shallow learning, uh, like, a, like, a, you might, like a different kinds of regressions, like logistic regression, things like that. These are convex. Uh, finance, as I've mentioned, logistics, supply chain management, a lot of interesting applications in control. Um, we should have probably, for, for just sex appeal, included some video of the SpaceX rocket, because that actually is solved using essentially this methodology. Um, that's, a, that's a really cool application. Uh, it was also, something similar was deployed on one of the Mars rovers. I'm not sure which one, but that, that, that was pretty exciting. Uh, vision and image processing, sort of related to that imaging stuff I was telling you about. Networking, uh, just allocating, you know, different packeting schemes or allocating bandwidth. Different engineering design situations, uh, combinatorial optimization. Uh, here, com so you'll see later on that convexity is more about continuous things, but even so, it can actually be used to solve or get a, be a good sort of subroutine for many discrete problems as well. The general approach for all these application areas is to sort of think about your problem and formulate it as convex. Uh, this is kind of an art, uh, not necessarily so easy, but fortunately people have you know been doing this for a long time and so 
anything you're interested in, you'll probably be able to find some similar application that has been developed before. Um, we'll, we'll, you'll see the materials later on, but my advisor's book has just like hundreds and hundreds of different examples um, that are all derived generally from real, real applications. So this is, this is something that's, I, I think, more and more accessible, or a piece of the process. Uh, now, once you've done that, uh, and you've put it in, say, CVXPy, as, as you guys are going to learn how to do, then you can solve it numerically using off-the-shelf software. Uh, so you know, this is an area of optimization that's well-developed enough that it's basically technology. You don't have to play with like learning rates or anything. You don't have to babysit it. It'll just work. Uh, and in terms of the formulation, there are a few tricks. Uh, you're going to get to play with this later. Uh, there, but there, there's just sort of some standard things you learn for how to handle this. Um, and there is some art in figuring out, okay, well, I want to include this in my model, not include this. Uh, but I actually think that makes it more fun, more interesting. Now, for medium-sized problems with 1,000 to maybe 100,000 variables, this is basically you can just use off-the-shelf tools uh, there are open source solvers, there are commercial solvers uh, that can maybe go a little bit higher in terms of dimensionality, generally based on interior point methods, uh, which are very reliable methods, uh, very high precision. Uh, and they can exploit the sparsity of a problem. And yeah, this is used all the time in, in finance, control, various other settings. Uh, you could run this in a control loop, you know, at uh, at, at 10 hertz, uh, and it'll, you know, work reliably. Larger problems going up to, say, a million to a billion variables, here you're going to have to do a bit more work. Uh, you can use things like LBFGS or stochastic gradient, other methods. You, you can, I, there are a lot of packages for this. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do this. It's generally going to take a little more, more tuning and babysitting to get these to solve. Uh, and you will have to think more about your computer architecture, things like that. But it's definitely very doable, not a huge burden. And this might arise in machine learning for sure. Uh, also, maybe image processing. That can get, those are problems that can get pretty large as well. Modeling languages uh, are another important piece of the ecosystem. And that's what sort of our focus is going to be on. Uh, CVXPy as a modeling language. And the idea here is that these modeling languages allow you to express your problem in a high level way. Uh, so often the solver standard form, like the input to these solvers, is not really that user friendly. You have to be kind of an expert in optimization to be able to express your problem in that way. And so we created these, these uh, high level languages to make that process uh, just something that is handled automatically, just like a compiler will automatically convert your code you know, into assembly. You don't need to worry about that. And this has made things a lot more accessible. The originals here were YALMIP and, and CVX, uh, which are in MATLAB, uh, and then CVXPy, which I'll be talking about uh, in Python. And there's also a Julia version and an R version, if you're interested in those languages. CVXPy has been developed since 2014. Uh, it's now a really, really nice community, um, and it's awesome that 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 we can, you know, have the three of us here to talk about it. Uh, it has a nice system for verifying convexity that that Riley's going to tell you about later today. It's open source. Uh, it comes with open source solvers, so you can use it all in a fully open source way. But you can also use whatever solvers are are available, like commercial solvers, all kinds of solvers. It supports uh, parameters, uh, which are you know symbolic constants, um, which is it's a small thing. It sounds like a small thing, but it's actually enabled a lot of very cool applications. Like we have automatic differentiation through problems. Uh, like you can put your problem in a PyTorch. We have um, code generation, also based on parameterization. So that that's been like a really fruitful area. And as you'll see, it's, it's just a normal Python library. It's very easy to mix in with other code and build a really uh, nice code base uh, on top of CVXPy. Um, and it's used in many, many different research projects, companies, classes, all over the place. 
And it's hard to know how many users we have, but I, I think it's probably tens of thousands. Here's a CVXPy example problem, right? So we import CVXPy, we define a variable x, so we've created an instance of the class variable with dimension n, where n is defined outside this snippet. And then we start setting up our cost function. So here a and b are gonna be NumPy arrays, uh, so 2D and 1D arrays. And we've overloaded matrix multiplication and minus and all these arithmetic operators so that it's captured by CVXPy and it forms this expression tree. And then we apply the sum squares function, which you know, takes the square of everything and then sums it. This is a CV, as you can see, this is a CVXPy function. And this is an important aspect of CVXPy. Uh, you have to use the functions that are defined in the library. You can't uh, do black box functions. Um, and that's to verify, guarantee that everything is gonna work out, guarantee convexity. Here's a, another function, uh, the norm, so the sum L1 norm, so this is the sum of the absolute values of X. Uh, so here, this is kind of like a lasso problem, if you've heard of that. We combine these together and we get this cost function, which is an expression, CVXPy expression. Uh, we construct a problem object uh, and then we minimize uh, the cost, so that's our objective. And then we have a list of constraints, uh, which in this case is just one constraint, and we've overloaded less than or equals to construct this constraint object. Uh, and this is saying that the, uh, the largest absolute value of x has to be less than or equal to one. Then we call dot solve on this problem, and notice there are no parameters here. Uh, in general, you won't need any. Um, it's, it's very reliable, and uh, it'll just handle everything for you. Uh, you can, of course, if you know more, want to use a particular solver, or a particular solver option, you can do that as well. But gen ideally, you would, it would just work, and it, generally it does. So that returns the optimal, yeah. Yeah. Is so, that just a matrix yeah. Application? Okay. It, yeah. Specific to CVX no, this is the new Python uh, symbol for matrix uh, multiplication. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. Since Python 3.5, um, to disambiguate times and and uh, okay. at uh, and ma to ma dis disambiguate like um, element-wise multiplication yeah. and matrix and multiplication. Matrix. Uh, what type would be a? I mean, is it is it a is it a specific type? Well, it can be variable, or is it just is it just the matrix, just anything like NP? Yeah, essentially anything. So normally it would be like we support a lot of different uh, like formats for constant values. So normally it would be like a NumPy array, um, ND array. It could also be like a SciPy sparse array. Um, those are the main ones we support. Um, but but generally any anything that you would use to express this. Mm -hmm. so you said this is like like a lasso setting. What would be what would would be in the A like typically? Well, how would it look like? You, you oh, the, does, does the question make sense? Um, like when I look at it from from the view of someone who does machine learning, then mm -hmm. you say this is a lasso sort of solving thing. How would the A look like? Because if, if I if I think about a lasso thing, mm -hmm. I think about the data points mm -hmm. and then. Uh, is, I mean, is this the same thing? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, it, it's not set up to be super clear, but it's ba for, as, a, as a lasso problem. Basically, the A would be your, your like data, like your training data, and then X would be the fit, like you could say X are the features that you're fitting, right? And then it's a linear model, so A times X. Um, and maybe you, could, you can include the constant offset in this, this setup. And the, but, the rows of A would be your individual data yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, right. the entries of yes. B will be your labeled observations. Yeah, uh, and then you're penalizing the the feature weights to try and get them to be sparse. Um, and then there's there's some sort of constraint on this. I'm not sure how you would interpret this exactly. The constraint thing is yeah. just something. Yeah, this is just to have have a constraint in this situation. Uh, yeah, no, very very nice questions. Uh, so here, yeah, A, B, and gamma are constants. Uh, in, in different, many things are supported, but generally like NumPy arrays. And 
after you call solve, uh, it assigns the like solution value of x uh, to this dot value field. So all the variables get a solution value, uh, which you can read off later. These modeling languages have had a really big impact since CVX in terms of making convex optimization accessible to non-experts. It's, I think, really nice how easy it is to experiment with different formulations, right? You can just try all kinds of different things, and without this, it, I mean, it, would it takes quite a while to get it into the standard form, and so this makes it, you know, much more flexible. And I think uh, more recently, I've, I've started to see how it enables like more complex models. Um, like for example, I work a lot now at my current job on sort of object-oriented uh, model structures, where there's lots of components coming together in interesting ways. And it, it's, it, it can get, it, it can be really quite, quite complex and something that it would be very difficult to even write down as like a single problem, like on a, on a whiteboard. So that's something I'm pretty excited about, that there's well, sort of new frontiers here. And there may be some losses in terms of trade-offs. It may be slower than if you, you know, really were, if you knew exactly what you wanted and you just write a custom method. Yeah, it probably will be faster. Uh, but it, not by much necessarily. It depends on the, the application. Like if it's something that people have really worked on for a super long time, then there may be very specialized solvers, yeah. When you say custom, are you talking about like uh, essentially writing out the, like the cost function and the constraints and everything yourself, like not using the CDX pi functions? What exactly do you mean by customizing it? Yeah, well, like write your own? yeah well there's, there's different ways. Like I guess, for example, like Let's suppose this was like a lasso problem. Like it's not exactly, but let's suppose it was. Well, you could do CVX Pi or you could use like, you know, scikit-learn, yeah. right? And scikit-learn is probably gonna be faster than CVX Pi. I mean, for the lasso, it definitely will be. Right, you're uh, just not really coming, it's just kind of embedded at it, right? You're not coming at it from the optimization lens at that point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more of this functional, you know, it's like we, these are the different functions that, that you know, it support, like in scikit-learn, like you can do this model or this model or this model. Right, and so people can really, you know, spend a ton of time making this model, you know, as optimizing this particular code path as much as possible. Here it's mapping it into a more generic setting. So it's not, like it's, the solver is, is not as specialized. Generally with solvers, like the more specialized they are, like there are benefits to specializing. Yes. Um, and so there's sort of an inherent trade-off between generality and, and um, you know, speed performance in some, some sense. Uh, and that's a, but so there is some gap, um, but that's something that, that we're trying to, you know, we've worked hard to close. And, and I think once you really get into this, like, you know, you're going to have so many things in your model or there's so much flexibility that it, it's not really going to map anymore into anything in like scikit-learn. Uh, and then uh, another limitation is scaling. So this is not, this doesn't yet scale to like the levels of like PyTorch or something like that. Like you, as you saw, like a million to is billion, that starts to push this. Um, so that's something we wanna, we wanna fix. Uh, but for, for most settings, I don't think you need, other than machine learning, I don't think you really need so many variables. Um, but we would like it to also just work for such large problems. Here's some examples uh, that I think are very cool. Uh, radiation treatment planning, this is a real example from uh, work that was done at Stanford uh, in, in my advisors group. And the idea here is, you know, someone has, has cancer and you want to treat it um, by radiating it. And you basically have, you know, some sort of machine that they're in and that the person is in and beams can be shot from different angles, right? And you want to figure out uh, basically how to deliver this, this dosage to the, the tumor um, using these different paths that you can, you can shoot the beam from, right? So each, each beam has some intensity uh, that's non-negative. Uh, and then you basically voxelize the, the patient, right? So you have this 3D model of the patient. And each voxel is going to receive, as a consequence of this radiation, some amount uh, some dosage. Uh, and this is actually a linear mapping, which, you know, we need it to be for convexity, but it is. Um, it's 
there's a lot of number crunching that goes into getting this matrix A uh, behind the scenes. But you know, once you have that, then you're good to go. And you know, ideally, you would deliver the desired dosage to all the tumor cells and no radiation to any other cells. Um, but of course, that's not possible because in order to get to the tumor, you have to go through other cells, right? Other other voxels. Uh, so you need to kind of trade this off, uh, you know, trade off the unintended dosage with the real dosage or with the intended dosage. And just in terms of dimensionality, you could think of there being like a thousand beams, like that's how the discretization of the locations, uh, and then maybe like a million voxels. Um, so the they'll focus on like a particular area of the body, so like a million voxels. And the way we approach this through convex optimization is first we write down just like the, the basic, you know, physical constraints, like that non-negative beam intensity, and then the relationship between the beams and the, the dosage. Uh, and then we want to penalize the dosage somehow to like get, get the behavior that we want. And what these uh, researchers concluded is that a really nice way to do this is to have basically a particular penalty for overdosing and then a particular penalty for underdosing, which is going to depend on each, be different for every single voxel. So, you know, if it's a tumor cell, it probably doesn't matter too much if you overdose it, right? That's fine. But if you underdose it, that's really bad. Uh, conversely, if it's like a non tumor cell, overdosing is extremely bad, underdosing is fine. Uh, and so, by setting these weights nicely, you can get uh, sort of the, exactly the treatment plan you want. Uh, and here's an example for a real patient case. Uh, and this has, I guess, 360 beams, 360,000 voxels. Uh, and this was still when the validation stage of the research. Uh, so they validated that the, met, that the treatment plan generated by this approach was very, you know, essentially the same as what the clinician came up with. Uh, but this was computed in only a few seconds uh, using uh, a GPU versus the original plan took hours of weight tweaking. Um, and so it's clear that this is like, you know, getting into potentially new methodologies for this application. And there's been a lot of follow-up work since then on, like, for example, they actually made like this nice Python package for the clinicians where they can explore the different plans. And right, if it only takes a second to compute, you could really look at all kinds of possibilities. Um, and so this is an application that, you know, is, is really, uh, really nice to see. Another very cool one, uh, more recent, is Hyperloop system design. Uh, this is by Kirshen uh, and Brunel uh, in 2021. So Hyperloop is kind of a futuristic concept for mass transportation. Uh, and generally, it's like the idea, and I'm no expert, but the idea generally is that you have these tube or these pod, pods, like these vehicles, that are shooting around through this low pressure tube, like some sort of low pressure enclosure. And this is a very exciting area for people in, involved in, in transportation because you know, it's, it's a clean sheet problem. There's no real limitations on how you can do this. You can really look at it from first principles uh, versus a lot of existing things. Like if you, it's very hard to just come up with like a new plane. There's a lot of restrictions on that or like a totally, you know, crazy design and, and get that actually deployed into the world. Uh, and it's a very complex design problem because all these different components are connected uh, and, you know, your choices for like how big the pod is going to be is going to have like many ripple effects for the rest of the design. And so ideally you would sort of consider everything together. And here's a visualization of the design relationships, like the connections between the components. So. This, it was organized hierarchically uh, when they did this. So there's like a pod, like the vehicle, it has all these different subcomponents. Uh, and then there's different aspects of like the fleet of pods, like the way the pods can relate to each other. Uh, and then the infrastructure to you know, support the whole thing, like the tube and whatnot. Uh, and, and altogether, like this generated a problem that had about 5,000 variables and 6,000 constraints. Uh, which, you know, actually only takes like a, a few second or so to solve um, very, very fast. Uh, and so they could really explore the design frontier for this problem, because generally you don't have like some objective. It's like, oh, this is exactly what I want, this objective, boom, I'm done. Usually you want to kind of trade off different aspects uh, and see 
and, and explore the possibility space. And so this is an example of a parameter sweep. Uh, the details, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but the idea here is they have, they're starting off with a particular optimal design uh, where you can, the pods charge at like 10 amps. Uh, and they wanna see what happens. Well, what if the pods could charge faster? Like how would that impact everything? Uh, and this optimizer just sort of, you know, recrunches everything and adjusts all these different factors. And so, you know, as you're, cha as you're increasing the charge, um, it's like oh, saying, okay, well then I need, don't need as many charging stations or uh, my uh, pods can go faster, like all these different things. So, so it's like a nice uh, paradigm for, for doing this kind of work. This is a more stylized example for control. Uh, so the idea here is that you have uh, states, which are like basically all the information about your system to know like what's going on at a particular moment. So like, you know, it's location, velocity, acceleration, like stuff like that. Uh, and then you have actions uh, that can be taken, like you can apply this thrust or, you know, th this th turn on the, move the aileron, stuff like that. Uh, and you need a linear relationship, which seems a little bit constricting, um, a linear relationship in terms of like how the states update into the next state and then how the controls impact it. But this is actually not such a limitation. People will often linearize nonlinear dynamics. Uh, and, it, and that tends to work fine if you, if you run it at a high frequency. Um, so, so this is a very common approach to control. Um, and it handles like things like LQ, it includes things like LQR, uh, if you've heard of that. Uh, and then you have, you know, different constraints on your states. Uh, we have like special ones for the terminal state, um, XT. Uh, and then stage, so we, and then we have costs uh, for each stage of this process, like X1 through XT, uh, including the terminal state. So this is just kind of a stylized thing. Uh, here we're doing a little tiny problem with eight states and uh, two controls, uh, 50, time horizon of 50. Uh, and here uh, we've just chosen random dynamics that are, that are sort of reasonable for a, such a system like this. Uh, and then we are constraining the largest absolute value of the controls to be less than or equal to one. So controls have to be between negative one and one, essentially. Uh, and then uh, we want to target x equals zero, right? So we've just kind of defined the state so that that's, that's our endpoint that we want. Like zero is where we want to be. But of course, if we're some, you can always just offset things, right? It's, it's just an offset. Uh, and then it's very traditional to penalize, have a least squares penalty here. Like this is how you get most like standard controllers. Uh, and there's often a closed form solution in that case. Uh, and you can get like a linear mapping from your controls, from like your state to what your control should be. Uh, but you don't need that, you don't need to have a closed form solution uh, necessarily. You can just, you know, run this optimization in a loop um, and, that, and that's very effective. Uh, and so we initialize this randomly, uh, and you can see a few of the control, a few of the states being driven towards zero. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the path is not, you know, it, it's a bit of a winding road, right? They're going away from zero, then back towards zero, right? This one's going up and down, up and down. Uh, and then the controls kind of behave like you would expect. Uh, they're sort of shooting between one and negative one, um, though there is some concern for being close to zero because that's in the objective. Uh, just very, very briefly, uh, this is a machine learning example. Uh, here we have uh, features, xi, uh, feature vector, and then we have, this is a binary problem, so like spam, not spam, something like that. Uh, we have a linear classifier, so uh, we just evaluate this, this linear function that we learned. Uh, beta, you know, is the feature waste, and then nu is this constant offset, and then you look, is that What's the sign of that? That'll tell you if it's plus one or minus one. Uh, and this is, this is how you formulate an S, uh, a support vector machine. Uh, but we've added in, you know, since we can, uh, some regularization to make the features sparse. So this is a SVM with feature selection. And here uh, we evaluated uh, this approach. Uh, we, we you know, do parameter selection on how sparse we want things to be, right? Basically, as we increase lambda, it becomes more and more sparse. And there is an optimal sparsity because we included some features uh, that are not necessary, that are like not part of the real, true uh, feature set. 
Uh, and so around, you know, Lambda's 0.5, that's like the best set of features for this, this little example. So, so you used the optimization to find the Lambda? Or did you use the optimization to solve the machine learning? Yeah, so we, for any particular, we fix Lambda, then we solve the optimization problem. That gets you the, the feed, that fits the, the features. And so, but then we do a, out, outside that, we do a, like a loop over different so values of Lambda. Loop, so you're not using um, optimization to find the Lambda? That's right, but yeah. Would that be possible? Um, well, I mean, you could come up with more efficient algorithms than this. I mean, it, it's, yeah, there, there are, I mean, yeah, th this sort of gets into convexity. It's like, so lambda is not, the problem is not convex in, in beta, nu, and lambda together. Um, if it were, then you could just include lambda in, in the, you know, CVX, CVX probably could just handle it and it would be one problem. Um, so here, uh, if you fix lambda, then it is convex. Uh, and so, yeah, you could come up with some method that's gonna look at all these things together. Um, and, and potentially. For, and for me, as, as a newbie, um, how would I know that the problem is no longer convex if I, if I include lambda? Is it just something you know because you tried it, or is it something you see because you have some... Yeah, there's actually, it's, it's a great question. It's very well defined, and Riley is going to give a whole talk about how to do that. Um, but this is like, you're going to be experts by the end of this. Like, you'll, you'll know exactly when it's convex and when it isn't. Uh, and then here's an illustration of how the, the feature selection is working as we increase lambda. It starts off, if lambda is very small, then there's, there's no feature selection. As we increase it, these more and more features are driven towards zero until here we have four different features. Um, and at a certain point, we don't have any features, and then it's just a constant offset. Uh, in summary, uh, convex optimization problems arise in many different applications. You're going to get to play with a lot of these today. We have a lot of exercises for you. Uh, and they can be used to solve, you know, solve medium scale problems generically, meaning you really don't even need to know what solver you're using. Uh, and then if you have a very large problem or a larger problem, you may need to, to think a little bit more about what solver you're using. Um, but that's not necessary. There's a, there's a lot of support for that as well. Uh, and then these these prototyping tools or these high level languages really make this this all very easy, um, as as you'll see today. Uh, we'll talk later about resources and we'll post these slides. So this is more just like a reference. All right. So now we have our first uh, like exercise session, and. If you go to your uh, that um, uh, repo that you cloned, so the CVX short course, uh, you'll see in the README that there's this hello world example. So we want to take this time to sort of make sure everyone has a working environment, uh, can run the hello world. Uh, and then if you have like extra time, like there's also a, another exam, there's another um, exercise that you can do, like an ex it's, it's called extra. Uh, and that, these are from the README, so you can see in the README all the different exercises we have for today. Yeah. Sorry, I came in a little late. Can you post the link to the, to the Slack, maybe? Uh, to, to the CVX short course repo? Yeah, it's in the Slack. Um, it's, it's at the banner of the Slack. Yep. Are the slides from the repo? Uh, they, they're not in the repo right now, but we'll add them. Okay, so um, in this talk, I'm going to cover like one of the most important things when it comes to using CVXPy, namely, uh, how do you get it to accept a problem and not yell at you with an error saying problem is not DCP. That's, that's something that uh, you'll hopefully see with decreasing frequency as you use CVXPy over time. Um, the, so this, this standard form we saw in Steven's talk, uh, the 
objective will be to minimize a convex function. Convex functions uh, constrained to be less than or equal to zero and linear equality constraints. Now, that's a, a, a very general form. It's not the form that is used algorithmically. So CVX pi exists to make it easier to access really high performance numerical solvers that are written in typically C. The standard form of those solvers is surprisingly simple. You only have a linear objective function and linear equality constraints. Then there's this funny looking thing saying x belongs to a set k, which this, the, the term here is that k is a convex cone. The simplest cone is the, gonna be the cone of just element-wise non-negative vectors, but out in the wild too much. Yes? Sorry, can you reiterate what, um, like, what a parameter would be? It would be like a, like a weight in front of like an L1 norm or like something like that? Um, a, that is one of the uh, most common cases of parameters, yes, like a regularization parameter, something that's going to be held constant during optimization, but um, what CVXPy will do when you use these parameters is it will par uh, perform really like most of the transformations in getting to this format, but it'll stop one step short so that when you update that parameter, it can very quickly update that problem data. So this can be useful specifically when sort of training some shallow learning model and you're trying to do cross validation so you need to solve a bajillion problems that are more or less the same. Any other questions? Okay, um, when it comes to solving a convex problem, really the, I just see, see this says use an existing custom solver. This is kind of a, ah, okay, yes, yes. So this is like, um, like something in scikit-learn or something. This is if you uh, do not uh, bring the light of CVXPy into your hearts. Um, the if you're trying to sh like uh, show off or get published in NeurIPS or something, then you can say, oh well, we developed our own customized solver that with it scales to multiple GPUs or something. Um, but this last one here is really CVXPy's philosophy. Uh, some very very brilliant people have dedicated their lives to making. Uh, at least dedicated their professional lives to making these uh, conic solvers stupidly efficient. Now, on to this question of um, how to make sure your problem is convex, how to have CVX Pi not yell at you. 
Steven showed uh, the definition of a convex function before. Co the, that definition is that a function of an average is less than or equal to the average of the function values. If a concave function, the inequality goes the opposite direction. A concave function, the function of an average is greater than or equal to the average of function values. Affine functions, that is like, I mean, linear functions plus an offset are convex and concave. And this is just sort of the vaguely general form of a scalar affine function. The one, one um, for the curious wondering why uh, convex functions are so important or so useful for optimization, the, there are many different answers, but one of them is that if you have a convex function, any tangent line is a global underestimator. This is the basis for like a lot of those customized algorithms that people use. This isn't as relevant in the in cone programming, but it's a uh, it's a nice fact. Okay, let me boy I'm trying to carry three things with one hand. All right, so in order to use CVXPy, you need to be aware of a small library of convex functions that you can use as building blocks. And then we're going to use these functions to construct more sophisticated convex functions. So one of them, uh, just raising a variable x to a power p, if uh, p is greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to 0, then this is convex. If p is less than or equal to 0, then we need to restrict the variable x to be positive. And this, this will happen automatically. If you ever write a CVXPy expression with like a 1 over x, if you use the inv pause atom, that's the name for it in CVXPy, then the constraint that x is positive will automatically be enforced. That's, I mean, unless I'm, yeah, OK, cool. <laughs> it would just be really bad if I got that wrong. So I wanted to double check. Um, Um, this is a, uh, ah, yeah, sorry, the, all, for um, non-even powers, for, for, uh, for yeah, for non-even powers greater than or equal to one, you must also restrict to um, x greater than or equal to zero. Because, yeah, you're, you're right that uh, x to the power three is like this squiggly guy, which is very much not having the property there. Um, the exponential function, e to, oh, sorry, did you have your hand raised? Uh, somewhat, but maybe something okay. Uh, the exponential function, uh, typically we like base e because we are uh, enlightened folks who, um, uh, who use base e for all our exponentials and logs, but you can also use base 2 or base anything else. It will still be convex. x log x. So this is the negative entropy. Negative entropy is a convex function. Why is this important? It's because we like to minimize convex functions. So minimizing negative entropy is the same as maximizing entropy. So like in, in many models arising throughout like physics or information theory or wherever else, where the sort of your prior assumption is that some unknown parameter should lead to maximum entropy in a system, you can optimize for those parameters with appropriate convex models in CVXPy. We have the affine function. This guy here, x transpose px, this is, uh, this is called a quadratic form. What we need, having this p with the curly greater than or equal to zero, that means we need it to be symmetric positive semi-definite. That's like a long term that means, uh, well, the symmetric means what you think it means. It equals its transpose. Positive semi-definite, meaning that all of its eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. These are the best of all matrices. Well, positive definite matrices, where all the eigenvalues are positive, those are really the best of all matrices. But positive semi-definite are second best. Um, any and all norms. Just that, that's 
no, no. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the simplest, um, well, you can take the matrix to be one by one, in which case it's just uh, like it's p times x squared, where p is some greater than or equal to zero. So that's positive semi-definite is when, is when that scalar p is greater than or equal to zero positive definite would mean the p is positive in this one by one case. So the uh, graphing it in the, like in larger cases can be tricky, but one of the most common forms of these is um, when p is the identity matrix, in which case saying x transpose px is x transpose x is, in CVX pi's parlance, some squares. This is actually, I'm glad you, you've um, uh, gotten us to this point because this shows um, three different ways of writing an expression which will have very different results in CVX pi. If you try to use this, CVX pi will be mad at you because you're multiplying two variables and CVX pi is not going to say, ah, well, are you multiplying a variable times itself? It's just going to say you're multiplying variables. This is not something we let you do except under like super uh, specific situations. And we don't um, particularly try to check for those because what happens is you get an error when you see this and then we tell you to use either this form, specifically with uh, the function is called quad form x p. So this is the CVX pi function you would use. Or if you're really in this case when p is the identity, then we will tell you to use this one. The difference being a matter of efficiency and how quickly CVX pi can recognize that this is convex as opposed to recognizing that this is convex because here it's going to have to check the eigenvalues of P and this can be very expensive if P is a large matrix. I, that, that, that would help me a lot because those, those were important points, so thank you. Um, all right, now this, this one, this last one here, max, element-wise, max is a convex function. And you can see, like, conceptually, it's a sort of a piecewise linear thing. If you plugged in um, different affine expressions of a single variable x, you would get a piecewise linear curve. Um, here are uh, examples of concave functions, uh, say, the log of x, square root of a product. So this is allowed specifically because two variables and square root, this is the geometric mean. So you can go on the Wikipedia page and look up geometric mean if you haven't encountered it uh, in the past. Um, this is a concave function. X transpose px, that quadratic form, if all the eigenvalues of p are less than or equal to zero, this is concave. And as you might imagine, if max was convex, uh, then min will be concave. Okay. Now, here are some less basic examples. The, these are the kinds of things that, um, in order to present them to a solver in an appropriate way, it really, really helps to use CVX pi, because if you try to use like a generic thing that, that isn't, um, aware of, of the subtleties and how you represent these things, then you can run into numerical problems. So one is that when viewed as a function of two variables, x squared divided by y, where y is positive, this is convex. Now, the really crazy one is x transpose y inverse x, where y is a symmetric matrix and all of its eigenvalues are positive. 
when I say this is convex, I mean this is convex when viewed as a function of x and y. There are lots of situations in um, control theory where this type of thing arises, or at least in the control theory that some of my uh, um, sort of lab mates were working on at Caltech because they would often come to me with a problem, say, how do we approach this? And then we end up staring down one of these things. And, and that's good because we're looking at a convex thing. Uh, the largest eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix, this is convex. Concave functions, the log of the determinant. So the, um, conceptually, what is, what is the log of the determinant? That is the sum of the logs of the eigenvalues. This is, uh, I think this arises in Gaussian process regression, uh, but I can't actually tell you how. The determinant raised to the one over nth power, this is the geometric mean of the eigenvalues of a matrix. Uh, one also has the log of the Gaussian C uh, cumulative distribution function. This can be useful in constructing some optimization model where you need some condition to hold with sufficiently high probability. And in the same way that where max, the maximum element of a vector was convex and the minimum element of a vector was concave, we have the maximum eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix is convex and the minimum eigenvalue is concave. Yes? Uh, ah, yes, yeah. so it is, it is a stronger statement to say that when viewed as a function of x and y, oftentimes um, if we're not so lucky as to face a truly convex problem, then maybe we're in a situation where if we hold one block of variables fixed, then the problem is convex, and so we do this alternating approach. CVXPy isn't built for that, but one of the great things about having it being embedded in Python is that you can um, write pretty sophisticated code to, to make use of the functionality it does offer to accomplish much more sophisticated things. Yes, yes. Although you wouldn't really want to minimize the, the consider the regularization parameter uh, a variable in the convex optimization problem because the objective, the loss function is linear in the regularization parameter. So like, there's a question of what you would actually trying to be minimize, minimizing in that case. Um, with all those previous examples, the a go-to thing is to verify convexity by the definition, uh, but you can also check if the second derivative, or in this case, the Hessian, the second derivative matrix, um, is positive semi-definite. Now this is all very mathematical stuff. It would be great if you didn't have to concern yourself with this, and indeed you don't. That's the point of CVXPy is to make it so that you don't need to worry about these first two methods. Instead, we're gonna take this third approach, starting with a small library of functions, like the ones I showed you on the previous slides, and then consider transformations which preserve convexity. So we can scale a convex function by any non-negative number. So, if, yes? Is what you showed us the universe, uh, no, no, there are many. There, CVXPy probably has like, what, 30, 40, sort of, yeah. Um, you can, you can actually compose in this last sense. So if you have a convex function and then you have a convex increasing function, then the composition here is convex. And so you can build more, like materially more complicated functions using this last point here. Um, but you do ultimately have to work with CVXPy functions as building blocks. Yeah. Um, so some examples that for which we now can infer convexity based on the, build, the, the small family of convex functions I gave earlier and the composition rules. Uh, this, the two norm squared, 
So that's uh, this guy, x transpose x, some squares. This is convex. And so when we compose that function with an affine transformation, this is still convex. So we're good to go with the first term. I also said that all norms were convex. So we have here the L1 norm. That's the sum of the absolute values. And lambda, our regularization parameter, was non-negative. So this term is convex. And then the sum of convex things is convex. So this, this is like the quintessential example when um, you're being tasked with constructing a convex function starting with simpler ones. A much more sophisticated example is the sum of the k largest elements of a vector. And um, the, I, I will give a hint and, and see like, um, how quickly the connection can be drawn. There will be a, a little exercise shortly. Hint being, you can use the fact that the um, largest element of a vector like that function, mapping from the vector to its largest element. This is a convex function. Um, and you also have that taking a sum is a convex function. So uh, any thoughts as to how to get from those two building blocks to this guy being convex? So it's uh, actually, I'm not going to say here. I'm going to wait until the exercise slide, which I believe is coming up very shortly. Um, for those who want to, who uh, find like this optimization stuff very compelling and you do more reading on your own, um, this function here is called the log barrier for a convex set that's the set of vectors x where each of these functions F, each of these convex functions is negative. Um, but that's just a, that's like a higher level math example, not something we need here. Um, I presented a list of rules on the convex calculus slide. And it is, personally, that, that is how I learned how to show that something is convex, was with kind of that handful of rules. But if you're clever about things, then you really only need one rule. If you have a convex function h, then you can compose it with these other functions f1 through fk. If h is increasing in its ith argument and fi is convex, then sort of that part of the composition, we're good to go. Now, look whenever h is decreasing in its ith argument. If the corresponding fi is concave, Again, you're good to go. If um, any, for, for any uh, entry where fi is affine, and this might literally just be like, the, say, the, the map from a vector x to the jth entry of a vector. This, this is an affine transformation. It's a very simple one, but it is, it's one of the things that's kind of meant to cover this case. When you have these conditions, uh, you're done. So um, unpacking that rule for a funny looking function here, function of two variables, u and v, I want it to be convex when both of those variables are allowed to, to change at once. The starting point, we can say that x log x, log x divided by y Turns out this is convex in x and y. It wasn't on the list that I showed you before, but it is in fact convex in x and y. It's also decreasing in y. We have that our variables u and v are positive. We know that u plus 1 is affine. The min of u and v, um, this is a concave function. And because u and v are positive, both of these are positive. So by Going back to the rule, or the, the one rule from the previous slide, you can conclude that this thing is convex. So you don't need to take any derivatives. This is great news because it's not differentiable. You don't e need to plot it, um, which is good news because plotting two, 
functions of two variables is surprisingly painful, um, you can just apply that, that one rule to, to see why this guy is convex. Okay. Now what CVXPy does is it takes an algorithmic approach to that. It considers an, a, an expression. I put a capital E expression because that's the, like, the name of the class. The, and then it's going to look at the arguments to things called atoms that define an expression. So the addition operator, we've overloaded that operator. It, whenever you use it, there's a, uh, a corresponding CVXPy function. Stephen, is it called like add or plus? Yeah. Y you don't actually need to know the name because you're always going to use the addition operator. But the CVXPy internally says, well, the addition operator preserves non-negativity. The addition operator is affine. It tags all of this information, and then it parses this expression tree from the bottom up. So going back here, what CVXPy does is say that uh, it, first it's going to start at step two, then it's going to go to step three, then it's going to go to step one and say, ah, yes, given that the things in two and three are true, I'm able to use this fact and the whole thing's convex. So this isn't really what um, uh, the way a person would go about it, but it's a very convenient way to implement it, um, what's the word, uh, programmatically. OK. Um, this is another example, but I'm going to skip it. Oh, well, sorry, I shouldn't skip it. This website is your friend. So when you're getting an error, CVXPy is saying something is not DCP. That's, it's not uh, compatible with disciplined convex programming. Then you can go to this website, and it, this will parse. It will produce such a diagram for you where you can see sort of where problems arise when CVXPy is trying to verify that a function is convex. And I have to emphasize, when CVXPy is trying to verify that the function is convex, because this one rule, I said the title of the slide was, the one rule to rule them all, I, I mostly just wanted to, to make sort of a joke. Um, uh, there are plenty of convex functions that CVXPy does not recognize as convex. In fact, um, you can construct extremely simple functions that CVXPy cannot recognize as convex. And this is why uh, you, your, yourself in the future is grateful to yourself now for attending this to know the differences between what CVXPy is happy with and what it is not. Uh, but given all that framework, with CVXPy, you minimize some convex objective or maximize some concave objective. You have constraints that are expressed with these um, uh, binary operators, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, double equals. And CVXPy is going to parse the whole problem from the bottom up to determine if, if it's uh, going to accept it. Uh, you've already seen this sort of the, the vague appearance of CVXPy. Here, um, here is an exercise for you. In, you don't need uh, to use a Jupyter Notebook for this. You can just pull it up in, in terminal because it should be super, super simple. Uh, come up with a CVXPy expression expr for which this condition, expr.isdcp, is false. Yeah. Like, let's, we're going to take like uh, some time now to play with that website. I know this is like a lot of math. It's like early in the morning, um, but if you, it really, it really will click. Like, if you just use the website as like quiz mode, just like do that for like ten minutes. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. And like all of this will like come together. You'll, you'll see what we're talking about. Um, and then, like, just a little bit of context. So, like, why, why do we have all? A lot of thought into 
how to make this as user-friendly as possible. Like really thought about this a lot. And it boils down to, like they boiled it down to, to this um, rule about how to compose things. And in terms of like, basically it turns out that you can just have this like library of like 40 things and really that's all you need. And it's surprising that that's true, but that's how it turns out to work. And you know, sometimes people will come up with new things. They're like, oh, I can't, this isn't in the library, you can't make it. We just add it to the library. So it's like an evolving thing. Yeah, we've like, people, people make pull requests. Um, but yeah, this is, again, I think there's a lot of math. So I just, re we can take some time now, just go to dcp.stanford.edu. Um, and you know, once you do this, as Riley said, you're gonna be like, really, this is, this is the hard part. Like once you yeah. get this, that's everything you need to know. There's gonna be lots of examples later. Um, you'll, you'll see lots of applications. Yeah, the, the, I guess this is the first time I have uh, been involved in giving an introductory tutorial to anything TDF Pi related. Um, and I think it's uh, apparent that I typically speak to like a pretty mathematically oriented audience. Um, so like the fact that I went over here and emphasized, oh, three different ways of writing things and TVXPy will like them to varying degrees. This is just because I've seen so many people learn these this lesson, uh, and then it's made a big difference when they learn it. But this is something you learn later on, realistically. So yes, let's go to dcp.stanford.edu uh, and look through some example text. Oh, I have one question. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you have any, con uh, so a convex set is a set for which if you have any two points in the set, then the entire line segment connecting them is also in the set. Any convex set, you can turn it into a cone by lifting to one higher dimension. You can like, um, say if uh, in two dimensions, you have a, like a, an ellipse in the plane, you can stretch it down into three dimensional space. Now you have your, your ice cream cone, so to speak. And it's, uh, for, for why that's algorithmically easier, I don't have a quick explanation, but essentially it's that if you're willing to lift your problem to one dimension higher, everything is a cone. But let's, let's go to dcp.stanford.edu. I guess I'm gonna just uh, set the scene here a little bit more for some of the examples. I already talked to some folks that have some experience, experience in, fi uh, in finance. If you don't, that's totally fine. Um, I'm gonna introduce it basically from a, yeah, not assuming any knowledge perspective. Uh, and yeah, like the background is, um, like we've seen the, the theory part now. We have seen like the, the, the goal of optimization. Now it's gonna be a bit more about application specifically because the nice part of, of um, optimization is, especially convex optimization, we can actually apply it. Yeah? And there's many examples from different fields and people will actually solve it. And you already sol solved some toy problems. And the good thing is like, thanks to yeah, projects like CVXPy, the, the pr uh, problems that people will solve in the real world are kind of just you know, not too, too, too much bigger than that. So they might have some more assert statements or some more checks, but like, or some more business constraints, but the overall problem will not be like insanely different from what we are gonna solve today. And I think that's very nice. And it brings together like, I think convex optimization in general brings together like people that maybe just have specific do domain knowledge. They may don't know anything about uh, programming. They may don't know anything about math, but still like within you know a few weeks, they might be getting ready to, to solve some problems in their field. And it's basically from different directions. Somebody who's a very good programmer, but maybe doesn't have done like the math in a while, can easily pick it up and also apply it to different domains. So no matter which uh, domain you're coming from or direction you're coming from, I think, uh, yeah, you can pretty easily get started and, and solving some, some real world problems. So yeah, as my, I mentioned, my, my background is in finance, both from academia and also where I worked. So uh, I feel most comfortable starting with those examples. So that's one.
asset i, and we have basically n assets here. So that's gonna be referred to as the weights, and you can think of it, I have you know 100%, and I, and I wanna allocate this to um, different assets, and that's why we're gonna say like the sum of these to these different assets one to n. And therefore, the w is our portfolio allocation vector. Um, they have to add up to one, but that doesn't mean like uh, it has to be a convex combination. They can also be a negative. So this means I'm gonna short this asset, which is kind of the, the term you would use. And that just means um, I'm lending it now, I'm selling it, and then I'll be buying it back later. Uh, and hopefully, if the price went down, I'm gonna buy it back at a lower price, so I made a profit. That's why you call short. And then if you are, you know, if it's greater to zero, you would be long that asset. Uh, and then that's why you would say, if all of them are greater or equal to zero, it's a long only portfolio. Uh, and if you have shorts, then yeah, it's, it's, uh, you induce basically what's called leverage. Um, and there's different yeah, formulations what you call leverage. Some, that's also like, not everyone uses uh, these notations and everyone just says, says leverage, but you don't really know what they mean. So you always have to ask like, can you please write down mathematically what you mean when you say leverage? And one common uh, definition is this one. So you just basically uh, take the, the, the one norm, so the sum of the absolute values of your weights, um, which means, for example, if you have um, this would equal to, let's say, um, two, that means you can be short with a total of 50% of and then long with 150%. So it would add up to one. And you would often have constraints of the type you may not be like the L1 norm of your weights may not be more than two or three, which kind of gives you a, a, yeah, an upper bound on how much you can borrow. Um, yeah, there are gonna be returns that we wanna basically find the best weights that give us the most return um, with respect to some constraints on the risks maybe. Uh, and yeah, we model them as prices, which will change over time. If the price goes up, yeah, we make a return and we most often look at the, re uh, what I, when, I, when I say returns, I mean the change in the prices at the end of the period, basically with respect to the, where it was at the beginning of the period, divided by where it was uh, at the beginning of the period. So basically that's just a percent change in the price. Yeah, and, and that's uh, more easy to work with uh, for a variety of reasons that we will also see later. One of them being that if you wanna have the portfolio return, like how much did we make across all of our different assets and our weights that we chose, it's just the inner product of um, the transpose of this return vector and W. So um, yeah, commonly you would assume that these returns are random. You, you can model them as like a random variable. For example, one that has a, a mean mu and a covariance that we call sigma. And uh, this might be a wrong assumption. I mean, t it is a wrong assumption, so it's not random. It's like people to coming, coming together in a market, deciding on prices, where they, where they wanna buy, where they wanna sell. So it's a dynamic system, but we're just you know, uh, trying to approximate it with this random variable. And hopefully by finding solutions that are uh, good for our random variable, we also find um, solutions that will work good in practice, but that might or might not uh, be the case actually, depending on how good your estimates are. Like any model will, not be the true world, it will just always be an approximation, and depending on how good that ap approximation is, it might or might not work in practice. Um, so we define the expected return as the mean of our portfolio, and the variance of our, of our uh, portfolio returns would be the risk, yeah? Sometimes people uh, do the standard deviation of the returns, which they then call volatility, yeah, it's just a standard deviation. Again, everyone speaks a different dialect, every field, so, uh, this would be the, the volatility, or we, we'll, we're gonna stick with the standard deviation, um, which, uh, yeah, you can see that this one is con convex, we already saw it today, under one condition, yeah, we, we have some condition on, on sigma, it has to be positive semi-definite, mm, and then also the square root is um, convex too, but uh, people are, for historic reasons, I think they would real, um, quickly realize that this one is convex, and therefore kind of also uh, how it emerged Typically it's written, it's optimized over the variance, but then when you plot it, you're gonna plot it with the standard deviation. So because people don't really know that maybe this one is also convex. Um, and obviously we wanna have high returns, we wanna have low risks. And we have then, as always, usually in, con in optimization, you wanna have some trade-off between, between those, like there was the example earlier. You wanna have some trade-off between speed and efficiency maybe. Here you have the trade-off between 
return and low risk. Um, so yeah, just uh, writing our um, formulation or our form for the for optimization problem, so we want to maximize the returns minus basically this gamma, which is kind of a, a, a variable that determines how risk averse you are, because what we are subtracting is basically the risk yeah, that we just defined. And if you are very risk averse, this will, like every increase in the risk, it will hurt you a lot, so you have a, a large gamma. If you basically don't care about risk, you just want to maximize profits, you, you're going to set gamma to zero. So this will just parameterize um, yeah, how risk averse you are, but in this context, it's hard to inter interpret as a, as a raw number, so you can just think of it uh, by changing it, you're going to trace out uh, all the different combinations that for different risk aversions people might choose, um, and it's going to be like the Pareto optimal line. Uh, yeah, we can also have other constraints which are just denoted here as being in this convex set W, um, which in, in like, th th this can be empty, like we can say we just want to have them sum up to one, we can have infinite leverage and, and anything goes, but we can also make uh, more restrictions, we can say for example always have to be positive or we can have say what we saw today, the k largest uh, assets might not be more than, than x uh, or, or y. So we can have a whole different set of constraints. I'm going to introduce some of them later. Um, and basically, yeah, we're trying to optimize for this risk-adjusted return, as, it, as it's called, and we're going to have a trade-off. How does this look like? So we have 10 assets here in this example, and their risk here as the square root, so the standard deviation, uh, is plotted against their expected return here on the y-axis. And we see, like, um, if we optimize our portfolio and we don't care about risk, and we say we're in, in the long only case, so I cannot borrow, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to put everything in the asset that gives me the highest return. So if, if, if gamma is zero, then your vector will be just a one in the entry for the highest returning asset. And then if you say I'm more risk averse, then kind of I want to make trade-offs. So I'm going to find portfolios on this so-called efficient frontier, which just says like um, here it's plotted for two values of gamma. If I'm risk averse with like gamma equal to 0 0.2, um, seven, uh, 0 0.29, uh, I'm going to end up over here. So I'm, I'm going to have this amount of risk and this amount of expected return. And then if I'm more risk averse, I'm going to have less risk, but also less return. So typically, uh, if you have more risk, you're also going to get more return. And notice that like all of these points on the green line, they're better than all of the red points, right? Because they're going to have some covariances. So sometimes one asset will go up, the other one will go down. So what you get as a benefit, what people would call diversification benefit. So um, you're going to do better than all of the assets individually, except for like the, the one case where you are all in one asset. So this is how it typically looks like. And you want to be ideally over here. You want to have zero standard deviation and high returns. But that's not possible, right? So you're going to have to make some compromise based on the assets you're working with. And um, yeah, going to end up somewhere on this line here for this example. And then for any given of value of, of gamma, you can basically see like what's going to be the return and the risk for this portfolio allocation. And you can see if I'm willing to accept a higher risk, yeah, I have a bit higher uh, return here and the expectation, but also the variance will be higher, uh, indicated here by this wider curve in blue. Versus if I'm more risk averse, I'm going to accept a lower uh, expected return, but also the risk uh, would, be, would be lower here. Um, as I mentioned, there can be you know, uh, very many different types of portfolio constraints. The simplest one is be like, would be, for example, the leverage limit that we introduced, that we say that the one norm uh, must be less than, um, let's say, two, yeah? that kind of introduces an upper bound on your leverage. It can also contain things like you want to be market neutral, where you say, Basically, the M's are the, the weights that are within the market, indicated by what everyone is holding. So just the total market capitalization of the asset I, which you can just simply calculate by the number of shares times the share price. You know how much is the market valuing, basically, this asset. And you look at the covariance, yeah? It's just M transposed uh, sigma W. And this is the covariance between the market and your own portfolio return. And you can do things like uh, you want to set this to zero, meaning I don't want to be correlated with the market. And this is very ver valuable, for example, because if there are cases where everyone is doing good, the market is doing good, you're just investing in the market, yeah, you, you're going to be fine. But maybe there's a, there's a crash in the market, so you're also going to crash with your own portfolio. That's very bad, because maybe in those times, you, you're going to need more money. So 
uh, it's good if you're uncorrelated with the, with the market, meaning um, yeah, you, you don't follow the, the broad market trends, and this is typically what also hedge funds are doing, like that's where the name hedge comes in. You typically don't want to depend on the market, but you want to make returns that are more or less independent of the market, or at least uncorrelated. Um, there can be yeah, a whole lot of other constraints, saying like tech, uh, sector constraints, saying this, this stock I is in sector I, and all of the stocks that are in sector I in total may not be more than uh, some, um, some uh, share, or yeah, um, you can do different crazy constraints and, and maybe we'll see some of them later on. Um, here's an example for different, for one constraint that we say, okay, the, the, this basically means you, you cannot go short. Yeah, the, the sum of your, the weights, the absolute weights must be one. The sum of your absolute weights can be two and the sum of your absolute weights can be four, right? So I can employ different amounts of leverage and I can see Obviously, if I, if I can do more leverage, I, I'm, I will get more risk and therefore also more return. But I'm going to do it strictly better because I can still use, uh, choose to not use all of that leverage, right? So this will obvi obviously be better, but you might be constrained here for legal reasons or practical reasons. Um, so not everyone will have infinite leverage limit. So, um, and that just means that for a given risk aversion parameter here, or a, g a given level of risk, you will do better if you can choose to uh, borrow more. And I think there's an example here where we can see for the same risk limits, one, two, and four, we can see how would the portfolio actually look like, yeah? For one, which is on the very left, we can see we never go negative, yeah? And we just invest a bit here, 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 and here. But as you notice, it will, it's a very sparse solution, right? Because we don't invest in any of the first five assets. And if you're doing like um, L1 norm, lasso, as we just saw earlier today, you will be familiar that this often leads to sparse solution, and indeed this is what we see. But if you can, uh, if you can employ leverage, you can see that you will basically short the assets that you also didn't want to go in, so now you can even short them. Before you just couldn't buy them, now you can bet against them, yeah? So that's kind of makes sense that you would start, um, yeah betting against the assets that you didn't want to invest in in the first place, now you can uh, make it even better by, by not investing into them and, uh, and, and betting against them. Then I think we're going to talk about some variations. You can Before you continue, I'm just wondering, is yeah. this just like how you would do it in academia or is this how they really do it? No, this is how they r would really do it. Um, wow. So the, the problems are actually, um, the problems we're going to write up today in the, in the exercises are, as I said, a factor of maybe five uh, in complexity away. So it's not a, a huge amount. If you just look at the length of the problem that they would typically solve, maybe it's you know five times longer because they add some more business constraints and sector constraints and, and all of them at the same time, but conceptually it's not much harder than that. But I think what's the, the hard part is not solving the problem, going back to this one here. So as we said, like the, the mu encodes, what are your expectations about the returns, right? So that's a very hard question. So how do you come up with those, uh, with the data basically of your problem? And that's, that's, I think that's the more tricky part. And this basically means what's your private estimate of the returns of the assets. And, um, and typically there's a whole lot of variance into going into these um, estimates. And you, this could be like just a mean of the last 10 years. Yeah, this would be a very simple model. It could be some crazy neural network that takes into account how many trucks have stopped at Walmart delivering products, so you, 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 you expect if there's a lot of trucks delivering product, you might have um, a higher mu for the entry of Walmart in your stocks, right? So uh, this can have various degrees of complexity and um, same goes also for, for the sigma. So solving the problem once you know the data is easy and then um, yeah, getting the data, that's kind of the hard part. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it's easy because CVXPy exists. <laughs> yeah, and there's also libraries building on top of CVXPy that make it even easier, so you just basically give it your data and say, okay, I want to do mean variance, and, and uh, yeah, it will be even easier, but as we will see today, also um, writing it up in CVXPy is, is going to be just a few lines, and yeah, if you have good estimates for mu and sigma, it would actually work in practice, but that's the hard part. But you don't. Yeah, that's that's a problem. <laughs> you don't easily get them, and, and I think there was some some story that that mm, uh, the advisor of our group uh, mentioned that there's like labs in Berkeley, I think, that sell covariance matrices for hundred thousand dollars, which in this context is actually nothing. So, 
I would sell for ten thousand. Oh yeah, but maybe <laughs> yours is not maybe yours is not as good though. Right? So yes. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, that's that's the level of, of sophistication that goes into these covariance matrices, um, or also the muse in particular, because it's very sensitive to the muse. Um, all right. So yeah, we can have different constraints that we add on top of, of, of this problem. Um, and we will get solutions that might look uh, different depending on, on the, the constraints that we set. And yeah, as I said, there can be many variations on it. We can basically uh, turn around the problem and say, give me uh, at least this return and minimize the risk associated with that. Or we can say the other way around, I want to have um, maximally risk tolerance of, of, of some amount and uh, maximize the return that I can get for this risk. Uh, they're all going to uh, end up on this green curve, so it's basically just different ways of expressing the same problem. Um, one interesting thing is what you could not do is maximize the risk. Uh, you can only minimize the risk, and that's a common theme, again, in optimization. Typically, the problems we want to solve are the problems we can solve, which is good. Uh, and there, there might be different reasons for that. Some might be chance, some might that people just work more hard on the pre problems that they want to actually solve. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good thing that we can minimize risk and not maximize it. It would, would be worse the other way around. Um, yeah, and basically here we can see how we can express basically this, um, the, the, the risk also as a second order constraint too. Um, we can add more variations. We can say, okay, shorting typically is, is not for free, yeah, because I have to lend it from you and then I sell it and then later I'll, I'll buy it back. So in order for you to lend it to me, you probably want to be some uh, you want to have some uh, some profit from that too. So whenever I go short, for example, I incur some costs here. They would just be linear. Um, I can include transaction costs, which is very important because if I solve this problem every day, and we will also have an example of that later, maybe the optimal portfolio will radically shift every day because my, my muse and my sigmas will change because I have one more observation uh, that goes into them. And just minor variations in the, in the, in the inputs can lead to widely different outputs, which is kind of very riddle optimization in that sense because it's very sensitive to the, to the inputs. So we can say things like we want to uh, penalize deviations from our previous portfolio and we can do for example um, just like the absolute, we can just say the absolute deviation, the sum of the absolute deviations, we can also say we want to square them for example, yeah, so that would make sense in a, in a setting where the more you have to trade, it's not getting just linearly more expensive because um, yeah, the, how the market uh, microstructure works basically. The more you want to trade on one given day, it's going to be more than linear uh, uh, expensive for you to do so. So you can do like quadratic or you can just do three halves, which I don't know if that's a good a way to reason about it, but it's commonly used in practice too. So uh, yeah, any of those values would be, would be reasonable. Then uh, like this is what you would typically use to solve problems where you have like 10 or 100 assets. And you can reasonably expect to have enough data to, to uh, estimate the covariance matrix. But what uh, will you do in practice if you have 10,000 variables, right? So the covariance matrix will be very big. So you, you will probably not have enough data to just use the sample covariance matrix for that one. Um, so what you would do, for example, and without going into too much detail here, um, you can ba basically do like um, what they call factor models, which uh, if you heard of, for example, principal component analysis, this is basically it. And it will reduce, uh, so for each, um, for each asset, you will basically uh, break it down into exposure to these different factors. And then they, they call it loading on these, on these factors. And then you can reconstruct the covariance matrix basically just from the exposure to the different factors. Uh, plus then some risk that comes on top of it, um, which is not explained by the factors. So this will just be a diagonal matrix. That's why it's uh, noted D here. So you can basically, your, your risk and your, and your asset comes from the exposure to the different factors. And you can, they even have them like names for these factors. Some of them might exposure to, um, you know, to energy prices, let's say. So some companies might have a huge exposure to energy prices. If you're maybe Shell or Exxon, maybe you have obviously huge exposure. Some other companies might have only very minor exposure to that. And like the global development of oil prices, as we see, might affect one company way more than another. So that's basically how you can think about these, these um, loadings to these um, factors. And then this is what they would call the idiosyncratic risk component, which means 
this is just a risk that you incur that's totally not explained by any of those factors. Like let's say your factory burns down, that has nothing to do with the market. It's just like a risk that only affects you. And that's why this will be diagonal. Um, yeah, and you can just run the portfolio optimization based on this model and it will scale much better. Um, it will scale like if K is the number of factors you choose and K is comparatively small uh, in, in comparison to N, which is the number of, of assets you have, then N K squared is much, much smaller than N cubed, basically. And yeah, we're not going to go into detail about um, what exactly, uh, how exactly we derive this model, but uh, basically, basically we just say we can Instead of the actual covariance matrix, we can use this factor, factor covariance matrix instead. And here's an example just like to see the, the computational advantage, saying that, okay, if we have 3,000 assets, which is quite a lot, and your covariance matrix will be quite big already, uh, if we solve it uh, in, the, in the classical way, we would yeah, come up here with uh, like three minutes solve time. Uh, also, there's some progress. This talk was also, in it, or this slide was already uh, given a few, week, a few years ago, and this was 800 seconds, so just like the solvers are getting faster, the, the compilation is getting faster too, so I think that's also a good way that things are not getting so much slower. But then the factor model just solves in under a second on your laptop, one core single thread with uh, open source solvers, so I think that's, that's a good way of seeing like you can solve real world problems on your machine without having super expensive equipment uh, or, or super high computation power. And even, even the 3,000 asset one, which is quite a lot, like that's, right? Um, I just wanted to point out the CVX by slash OSQP. Yeah. Here, OSQP is a numerical solver. Like mm -hmm. the whole point of CVX by is to make it easier to use numerical solvers. Yeah. You see on the whiteboard there, it says prob.solve solver equals MOSEC. Mm -hmm. So in this example, you would say prob.solve solver equals OSQP. Yeah. So like in, in general, if, if there's a name for a piece of software thrown around for, we use the CVX Pi and blank, yeah. that and blank is probably a numerical solver, which you specify with solver equals blank. And also, uh, I tried this particular example yesterday by doing just the one code change I make uh, was writing solver equals mosaic. This went down to 10 seconds. Um, so just to see, like, okay, you can you can get sometimes uh, better performance by by changing to some uh, solvers that are proprietary, um, or like better optimized for your particular problem. Some solvers might work well on some problem class, but not as well on, on others. Um, so yeah, that's that's important. But if you wouldn't have CVXPy, right? So you you write your problem um, in your particular form. You formulate all of the constraints so that they fit exactly to the interface of the solver. Um, writing it to solve for mosaic would maybe take you a week because you have to redefine all of the interfaces. Some of them are very similar, some of them are very different. So the beauty of this is just you change literally one keyword argument and you get all of the interfaces that are also part of the CVXPy ecosystem basically. Uh, this will be taken care of and it will just match the format that is required by the different solver. Right? You can also uh, uh, add your own solvers by the way, um, but typically you would choose to use pre-existing general type solvers. Yeah. And then like you can do, so this is pretty, let's say, well known. Like if you take a finance class, most of those things would be, you know, you would, you would have heard of those. But with, uh, you know, CVX Pi, and there's also an example about that, we can do things that uh, now you, you basically, at, at the end of the, this small talk, you, wanna, you will be, you will know more than many of people working in finance actually know. So I think that, that's, a good, that's a good part. Um, what you would, could do is, for example, say, you know, I bought your covariance matrix for 10K, and then maybe you will sell me a different one for 5K, uh, and you will maybe sell one for, for 20K, uh, but I'm not sure which one of you is correct. Maybe you, because I paid the most, or you, because you're very, you're very, selling it, uh, very much selling it to me. <laughs> you're the best salesperson, maybe. So I don't know which one will it be. Um, so what, what, what can I do? I can just say, okay, I believe neither of you, but I will optimize my portfolio in a way that the worst case that can happen if either of your covariance matrices is correct, that I'll suffer the, the least loss, basically. So I will optimize my worst case. So this is kind of a minimax game. Um, so what you can do, and again, we will see more of it in an example, we can say, 
we have a, a fi first of all, we can say we have a fixed vector, right? We, we say we n already know the weights. What would be the worst thing that could happen under any of your uh, covariance matrices? So I could just, you know, try all of them, but also I could just write it as an optimization problem. And I think that's not the quite a interesting part. So I can just try all of your covariance matrices and I will know what will be the risk and I just take the maximum risk and I say, can I still live with that or not? If not, I might need to change my weights. But how will I change my weights? So I will just change it and then I'll just uh, try all of them again and then I see, did I do better or worse? Kind of, there must be a, a better way. So uh, you can- I think I will sell you different covariance matrix now. Oh, <laughs> that, 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 oh but maybe I'll complain easy. because, uh, you know, it, it, it- But only in five years. Yeah, that's sometimes a problem. You only find out later uh, how, how good it was, was or not. So uh, what I could do, I could say, um, given your three covariance matrices, find the, the, the weights that um, will, again, make me least unhappy uh, in, in the worst case. So that's kind of a problem where you combine portfolio optimization with this worst case analysis. I think the weights framed here, it will basically just uh, compute what's the worst case, but you can also combine it with like finding the weights such that the worst case will be least bad. So that's a different example, and I guess like not too many people know this because um, it's very easy to do, and now it's easy to do in CVXPy, so you could just you know come up with different covariance matrices. There's like a whole lot of literature how you would choose these covariance matrices. That's like shrinkage, if, you, if you've heard of that, or like just a sample covariance matrices, factor models, all of these different different types. So what you could do is like, maybe I don't trust either of these methods, but I can say, say I do maybe three of them, and then I just say, okay, um, I wanna do least bad in all of them, and maybe that would be better than just choosing sample covariance matrix. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, I guess we, we're gonna, not gonna go into too much detail about how this particular one is constructed, but um, I would say this is enough of like finance background. Now we're gonna solve all of these, all of these problems that I just uh, briefly introduced, and there will be more description on each of them for the, all of the exercises that start with uh, th 13. And you can choose to do them. If you say, I don't care about finance, that's not interesting at all. We also have some other examples that are into biology. There's one about, I think, the speed, uh, the speed efficiency trade-off. Um, and, and then there's the energy one that's, uh, yeah, you're optimizing, I think, the level of, of a battery, I think. So, yeah, feel free to, to query me on finance things or optimization things, any of us, uh, or energy things. Um, or linear algebra things. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, whatever you, you, you want to do, feel free to do so. Um, and we'd just be around um, yeah, checking in. I just wanted to add one thing quickly. So um, if you guys are in the Slack, I posted a bunch of stuff in the Slack, uh, like resources. Um, and one thing that's particularly nice uh, is this Pi portfolio opt, which is built on, it uses CVX Pi, um, but it's like a, even more user friendly. Yeah. Um, and like if you, you could really like just use this and just get some market data and like go to town. Like it's, it's really actually extremely easy to use and people use it in hedge funds. So maybe, th maybe this class will have be pay off. <laughs> when, you're, when you're interviewing at a hedge fund. Yeah, yeah, but sorry, go ahead. Oh, I think it's it's essentially been replaced by this other one. I mean, we we did that, but we like didn't really get very far with CVX portfolio, and this one is much much more developed. CVX. Unfortunately, it, it has gotten really uh, into only maintenance mode, so it's CV, uh, Pi portfolio is no longer <coughs> actively developed. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. More recently, uh, um, Martin, who, who developed it, he's gone to work. At a hedge fund, so. And someone <laughs> paid, paid him to stop making it, <laughs> yeah, basically. No, no, not that, but like it's just a lack of time, I think. So, ah. so if anybody wants to contribute now that you're all experts in, in finance and civic pipe, you know, um, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, as always, open source is always dependent on co contributions. Cool. Then I'd say, yeah, just choose the problem that's uh, interesting you the most. I think you don't have too much time, so, uh, and they, they take like probably like at least 10 minutes each or maybe even more. So yeah, just choose the one, start with the one that interests you the most and maybe that's kind of the order you should go for. Yeah, all right. I, uh, let's see what they stand out to me on the finance side. Ooh, 
imaging. So this this uses CVX probably? No, it? oh, it's okay. something I did that was related. Ah, okay. Just threw it in there for the heck of it. It's kind of a similar idea, but it's not CVX pi based. Hmm. Different, uh, very similar syntax. Though. Yeah, I mean, I wrote it. Oh, it's, it's, okay. it's the same. <laughs> it's like the same idea, but it's like these problems are non-convex, mm -hmm. uh, typically, or like people like to make them non-convex. Um, so, and also, it's yeah. There, there are a lot of. It was pretty interesting. It's like, um, like that if they require uh, more special treatment with to solve efficiently. And there are also some extensions built immediately on CVXPy. So, for example, I think uh, Riley, you mentioned before, when when you only fix one part and it, it's becoming convex, uh, and or like you linearize one part, uh, and then it's convex and then um, you can basically solve a sequence of problems that would um, you know get at least a good solution maybe it's because of it's not globally convex you might not get to the global optimum but um, you can still make a sequence of, of, of convex optimization problems that might get you to a good solution so there's also packages uh, built uh, on top of this this would be called DCCP for DCCP for convex concave programming basically and yeah I think there are some other ones. Uh, I think that the, the code generation that was mentioned before is also like built on top of CVXPy, but not immediately included. Um, yeah, so some extensions already exist. You know, you're welcome to, to hang out as long as you want, um, but I just wanted to say a couple things at the at the uh, four hour mark. So first of all, thank you for spending four hours with us. Um, that's a big commitment. I really appreciate it. Uh, we all do. Um, and yeah, um, this is, uh, you know, something that, that we've all been working on for a long time and, and it's really cool to share it, share it with people who are interested. Um, in terms of like follow-up materials, so I would definitely recommend uh, joining the Discord. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that people post um, and any questions that, that arise, like w that people will be very happy to answer. In terms of like other things you can look at to learn, um, and also this is all in the Slack, so so uh, look at that. There's a book about convex optimization. Um, it's it, it, that's a real that's sort of the key key one. Um, it has tons and tons of examples, like hundreds, um, and then there's like hundreds more in the additional exercises. There's also a class uh, at Stanford that uses the book and that has more of like a lecture format and like videos and so forth. It's the same material, but it's, you know, it, it's a different format. And the videos are on YouTube. Yeah, the videos are on YouTube, yeah. So you can look at that whole thing yourself. Uh, and then also, yeah, the slides are online. Um, I posted a link in the Slack and then we also put them in the repo. And, and then, yeah, this, these packages, there's a lot of interesting packages. There are others that, that I'm forgetting. Like, there's a lot of um, quantum stuff that, that uses CVXPy to some extent. Uh, so that's, that's another, another area. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope uh, you, you've, I hope we've been able to like communicate sort of how, how broadly applicable this all is. Uh, and I think one thing, like the thing I liked the most about studying this topic in my PhD is I started to see at the end like how all these fields were connected and sort of these common patterns that occur again and again and again across these fields. And I think that's what all this really enables, like having this, this consistent methodology for how you approach these things. Thanks. That's Gitter. We do have a. We did have a Gitter, but it was. We we switched to the Discord. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And for for longer discussions, um, you can also use the GitHub discussions feature. Like everyone knows GitHub issues. There's also GitHub discussions. Um, mm -hmm. People mostly use the Discord. Like there's long conversations on the Discord sometimes, um, because people will come with everything from like. Help with this DCP or, or why is my problem taking so long to solve? Um, I'm honestly amazed at how good a job Stephen does responding when there are like 600 people on the server. 